So my name is Jordan. I am with my own company, Damn Good Technology. And I thought I might like to take, to take a, a minute or, okay, it'd be uh, almost an hour uh, to talk about uh, the it, what I believe is the issue with hiring and a potential solution. Uh, but first, I'd like to talk a little about, about me, about my background, and kind of delve into a solution that I think we can all benefit from in order to hire the right candidates in technology. So a little about me. Um, I am a software developer. I am in and out of the industry. I like to say I am in and out of in the industry because I've had a, a rough ride of it. Um, I'm currently freelancing. I have found a lot of success with that in freelancing. Um, and I like to say I'm the organic owner of Damn Good Technology. Um, I, like to say, I like to say organic because I, it, it didn't necessarily start how I wanted it to start. You know, I'm very entrepreneurially minded, and so I was thinking, yeah, I'm going to launch a great product. Things are going to be awesome. I'm going to like really start my company. That's how it's going to start. Didn't end up that way, but I, this is how I'm starting my company, by freelancing and, and um, developing full stack applications for folks. Um, so yeah, my specialty is in full stack development uh, with a focus on automation. Um, I like developing apps for people, and I love automation because, you know what, I hate doing the same thing over and over again. Like, wh why, why not just get it done all in one foul swoop, right? I am also a multi-potentialite, um, and this basically means that I, uh, I just am into, like, everything and anything, um, kind of all of this, basically a jack-of-all-trades, master-of-none type thing, although I, I am trying... Uh, I am trying, and I have been able to develop some master of some things, uh, w which does which does strengthen me in the long run. Um, and yeah, I currently live in the Pacific Northwest. Any other Pacific Northwesters out there? You can um, say it in the Slack channel too if you're in there. Uh, so before I begin, um, yeah. So this is a perspective from a burned-out job candidate, somebody who would be applying for job after job not hearing anything back, even when I had a college degree uh, in my belt. And I also want, um, I, I meant to change the, the slide title. Um, I didn't want this to be the solution, um, since I don't want this to be a final solution, but I think I can provide a template, kind of a groundwork that we all can work from to move hiring in a more, in a more abundant and substantial direction where everybody benefits. I, w I want this to be more of a more of a talk where we ask, what if? Like, what if we do this instead of the old way of doing stuff? A little of my career background, I definitely had an unorthodox career path. Um, in 2006, I was pretty excited because I got an apprenticeship at OSDL. Has anybody heard of that, heard of OSDL? Um, if, you, if you know about Canonical, they, they bought OSDL. Um, actually, uh, Linus Torvalds actually worked for, for OSDL. Um, I, I saw his cubicle there and everything. Um, I mean, j just a little name, Linus, you know. Um, I'm sure nobody knows, n nobody here knows who he is. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sure everybody does. Um, so I, I, got, I, was, I was really excited, you know, a great apprenticeship at OSDL. My career was going to take off. All my other peers were just like at Safeway or, or you know, Starbucks or, or working those low, low wage jobs. I was, I was just going to rock it out. Then reality hit. Um, I basically had trouble finding any job. Um, I, 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 I was even trying to be really humble about it. Like, you know what, I, I realized, I, you know, I, yeah, I might not be able to like immediately get a, get a job at, um, at Google or AWS or, or a job like that. But hey, I, I, I couldn't like work my way up, right? And so, I, but around the time, um, you know, I think with the combination of the market crash and just that, you know, spurt apprenticeship that I could put on my resume, it was really difficult for me to really land any job. Um, and th this went on for years and years. I had, I, and so for me, it, w it was just a pipe dream to think that I could actually earn a living. Um, I had a lot of short, when I did have a job, the jobs are very short lived, especially in tech. You know, somebody very creative, it's really hard to, uh, to really fit in in technology and in a lot of those those high tech industries, um, and so because of that, my resume was pretty spotty. You know, like I would have like months and months of nothing, and then oh yeah, a little job here doing this little thing. Um, so I, my, I'm really embarrassed by my resume. Um, <laughs> I, I try not to show it to people unless 
unless they really ask for it and it's like, yeah, I can explain. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, so my greatest desire out, all, out of all of this was really to work hard to really use my skills and talents in order to benefit somebody. Um, so fast forward to the start of 2020. Does anybody remember what happened in 2020? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think we all do. Um, but that that for me was was a time of, of change of growth, and um, I for me that that's really where my career really started to take off. You know, I've I've had all these like odd jobs of like you know getting in with a company, getting let go very easily, um, and or you know, you know, with any company. And, but I eventually found a, you know, a retail job, you know, just another stopgap job um, in, in the place of me looking for work. Um, you know, I, I was in a pretty tough spot. Like I had to move back in with my parents. Um, it was, it was very embarrassing. Um, but I, I was freelancing at the time. I, I uh, was freelancing a bit before and of that and so it wasn't like at the start of 2020 I began freelancing I was you know still doing like very small projects you know very very poor pay um, but in 2020 that's really when it took off and so I was eventually able to get out of retail um, thankfully uh, you know being an introvert retail was was not for me <laughs> by any means uh, but it, it, I, it was definitely a learning experience and so from there I my career took off and I was able to quit my retail job and do freelancing full-time or more than full-time if any other freelancers <laughs> are in here. Um, so this has been my experience with, with the hiring maze and if anybody else can relate, then good on you. So a lot of employers want to ask, want to know, you know, what do you know? Can you do what the job is asking you to do? When, you know, which is fair. So a lot of them, what do they ask for? Get a profile, you know, pretty simple. You can just you know, get, a, get an easy indication about what somebody knows. But on the, on the same coin, a lot of times I would get, I would show my GitHub profile, you know, with projects that I contributed to, you know, pro even some projects that I've started. And they'd say, well, it's probably fake, which I, I agree is also fair. You can, it is possible to fake GitHub repositories, right? Um, then they would hand in coding, then they would offer coding challenges. Um, uh, has anybody here had to do coding challenges? <laughs> yeah, um, they're 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 pretty fun. Um, I don't like them for several reasons. Um, they're very impersonal. Uh, they really provide no feedback. Well, okay, there tend to be two types of coding challenges that any developers come into. There, there tends to be ones that are test based, like you know, it needs to be like a, a solid input, solid output. We will be checking it with a machine. It's either pass or fail. With that, it, the pluses are that it it does have a very concrete scoring, like it's either pass or fail. The downside is that it's very impersonal. Um, the and then there's the the kind where it's like we need a solution for this problem we're solving. You know, we'll review the code, we'll get back to you. The problem with that is that the scoring tends to be very arbitrary. Like you you don't know what they're really looking for. Like they could be looking for how you write your comments, they could be looking for how you name your variables, they could be looking for anything. Um, and, and so uh, there, it's very arbitrary in that sense, but at the same time, it's very, it, it's a lot more personable, so you can do a back and forth, communicate. Um, and so, you know, with, with all these coding challenges, it, it was difficult for me, I, I didn't even pass one. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm now freelancing as a developer, and. Uh, Maybe other developers have shared that same sentiment. Like maybe, I don't know, maybe you could come to me and give me a, a, a coding challenge. I might be able to pass it. Come, come talk to me later. <laughs> um, but for now, I, I have not been able to pass a single one and I've done like two dozen easily. Um, but really where I took off was, has anybody heard of this guy named Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary V? Uh, he is a business person, you know, very, very intense, on fire business person. I don't want to, his story is, is pretty awesome. I, um, if, if you want to look him up, look him up later. Um, I don't want to get into it. But something he said really stuck with me is that everybody these days is a media company. It doesn't matter what you do, everybody needs to behave like a media company, start producing content. Um, and so that, that's really where I, I, what I started to do. I started to produce content, talk about blogging, which ended up being my resume. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, or a couple months ago, 
for this talk. I just kind of wanted to get the sense uh, in the community how uh, how people feel about hiring and um, or sorry how people feel about the job market, how easy it is to find a job. Um, so I asked the question on Twitter um, for any job seekers out there: How easy it is it for you to land tech jobs? And yes, I got an overwhelming response of five votes. Um, <laughs> like you know, because that's that's uh, the overwhelming size of my community. But still, I, it's data, and so I uh, I I found that you know it's. 100% say that it's either n pretty hard or nearly impossible. Um, I would imagine that if I interviewed 100 people for, or 1,000 people, this would be pretty similar. I might get a few, um, a few weird people out there saying, oh, it's so easy. Um, <laughs> but I think for the most part, um, everybody finds it difficult. And, and in fact, um, I, did I did come across another poll that somebody else posted on LinkedIn um, where where it talks about interviews, and the guy was asking, okay, uh, where, how long should it take to interview? And the overwhelming majority said one to three interviews. Um, I, I'm afraid to ask who said six or more interviews. <laughs> if, it's a, if it's a job seeker, good on you. If it's a hiring manager, uh, l l let's not you know, even cross paths. Um, but um, overwhelmingly, everybody wants short interviews. And I think this is for both job seekers and, um, and employers that are responding to this poll. Um, so, and why aren't coding challenges useful? I can give you my, my take from a developer's perspective. They are not reflective of a typical work environment um, it, uh, for the same reasons that I was explaining earlier. Like, they, they can be very impersonal. Um, there's no collaboration, there's no communication. It's just basically, okay, what do you have? You might argue, oh yeah, but customers and clients are like that. Not really, I mean, there's like a lot of dialogue between you and the customer and you and the client. Um, you know, a lot of code reworks, a lot of revisions. Like, it, it, a, a software product is not final. I mean, that, that's the point of it. Um, yeah, so th those are. Um, I also believe that a lot of it is wasted energy. Um, and uh, uh, like really, it's only beneficial, I believe, to the higher job candidate. And even then, they've gambled one to two hours of the time. Um, really, I, I don't think there's any benefit to the employer. If, if there is, then it's usually canceled out just because the employer has to spend a lot of time creating these coding challenges, making sure um, employees can pass them, and only to, only only to get the, the candidate to, to show that they can do the coding challenge. So is there an alternative? Well, um, how many times have we been, at, been saying, once I earn a million dollars in the context of altruism? Like, once I earn a million dollars, then I will give money to charity. You know, like, once I earn a million dollars, I will save up for my, for my kid's retirement fund, right? Um, I, I've probably said it. Um, I'm sure I've said it. Um, most of us have probably said it, right? Uh, or maybe once I retire, then I'll then I'll have more time to to devote to volunteering in the in the local soup kitchen or, or planting trees or you know like we we all we all think in future in a future version of ourselves that is completely separate from our from our own selves, right? Um, but what if I asked, what about now? Like what, where, um, this, this sense of altruism, where can we think of it right now? And on, I'll be getting back to, to what this has to do with hiring in, in a second. Um, yeah, like it, it'll, it'll come around, don't worry. Um, so I, I came across a surprising sor source of abundance a couple of years ago um, when I was learning about ancient Jewish law. Um, and so a, a, little of a, a little bit of a history background for those that aren't familiar. Um, Israel, thousands of years ago, w uh, was enslaved by the, by the Egyptians. And they, for 400 years, grew up in slavery. And um, it, you know, they, they were oppressed. They were, they were not in good, um, a good situation. The Egyptians were controlling them, oppressing them for a while. Like there were many generations that that were that born and died that were born and died in slavery, and eventually, eventually they were freed. Um, and but you know they were this suddenly freed nation of like hundreds of thousands, 
they didn't quite know how to run a society. And so um, their God uh, gave them instructions on, on, how to, on how to live, how to create a society. Um, and this is one of the laws. It's called Peah. Um, and it's when you reap of the harvest land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of the harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. As I just think of this. Basically, we, um, the law is encouraging farmers that when you're, when you're harvesting wheat, like it can be so tempting to like harvest all of it, right? Um, but when you do it, don't, don't harvest to the edges of the field. You know, just, just like get lazy about it. Leave some for the, for the edges. And so what, what can be a modern day interpretation of this? Uh, for, for me, uh, it would basically be don't penny pinch, right? Um, and it can be so easy to penny pinch. And this is where I believe the abundance comes from. Uh, like, oh yeah, I meant, I meant to say, does anybody know what, uh, what, I, what I'm talking about when I mean abundance? There's like a, a mindset, abundance versus scarcity, where abundance is basically, I have more than I need, I'm able to give away. Scarcity is, I don't have enough, I, I have to scrimp and save and, and you know, I have to hoard, I have to I have. To have. Um, and abundance is very much a giving because I'll, I'll get it in return type of mentality. Uh, so what does this have to do in te with technology, right? I mean, most of us aren't farmers. <laughs> At least most of us aren't weed farmers. Um, and so what does uh, this have to do in, in 2021? Like the, they didn't have Linux back then as far as I know. Um, so the, what I would propose is that um, we can incorporate PA into technology. Uh, uh, I'm not going to like control your project or tell you how to do it, but uh, one suggestion is to break these larger projects into what I like to call gleanings. Um, you know, the, the edges of the field per se. And there, yeah, some, some suggestions are that there could be like small, sh uh, small non-showstopper bugs. Like for, for the projects that you're on, how many of you have like those small bugs, like it, maybe it could be, oh yeah, the, the box doesn't appear quite right, it's hard to read the text, you know, like they're not showstoppers, but still they're, you know, somebody should work on them. How many of you have, have some? Yeah. Um, you could also break the, the project into smaller chunks, like the, the monolithic application that everybody's afraid to touch. You could break off chunks and have somebody work on them. Um, and if, if you want an added bonus, you can reward the candidate for their efforts. Um, it, here, the, there is a greater some benefit, like the candidate actually gets real world experience. Like, uh, can't you imagine um, a, a, a college graduate with this? Like the, they, they're graduating college and then it's like, wow, I can actually contribute to something. And plus they get satisfaction um, with their efforts that aren't wasted. The employer also gets a benefit because they can actually see a working example of the candidate's code within their work environment, so on their project. And they can get low-level tickets knocked out, you know. So then, like the 200 tickets that you have lined up can get can get shrunk down to like five. Who knows? Um, and then this is a this can also be a pathway to potentially more open-source projects. And I don't know. I think think anybody here is you know is a fan of open source. I don't know. Um, <laughs> that's sarcasm. Um, so, what do you do if you're so? Um, for this question, what do you do if you're not sure to hire someone? Hire them. Let me explain. Um, so, is it, how many people here are numbers people? Like, you, you love numbers. Um, I, I am not. Uh, but I, I decided to crunch some numbers. Um, so, I, I, I suffered for two hours for this data. I, I sweated. Um, no, I, I, I did spend some time crunching some numbers to see the financial viability of this. And here's one scenario. So let, let's take a scenario where there, there, are, um, there are four stages for hiring, right? Um, Glassdoor says that there are 4, 000, that um, there's a $4,000 average um, that the company spends to hire somebody. That that's on all across the board, so um, I, I'm sure it's probably more in tech. But let's just say it's four thousand for now, right? For the sake of argument. So if there are four stages, it would be a thousand dollars per stage, right? 
And so then you can break it down into the job candidates. And let's say there are 200 job candidates that apply for the job initially. And then 10 are shortlisted. Five, um, five are kind of brought on board to get the coding challenge. And then one for the final, like, are you fit for this company? Yeah, so the last candidate gets $1,000 for um, paid on them for hiring. Uh, so the first, in the first instance where we have $5 paid per candidate, um, let's say we want to eliminate that or at least bring the cost down for that, uh, for that um, group. So uh, we offer gleaning as part of the interview process. Let's, let's say we do that, like a, a short, maybe it, it's a, a small project that we want done or, or something like that. Um, then, and let's say 50% of the candidates respond. I'm sure that in reality it would be a lot less, but let's say it's 50%. Um, that means that in order for this to, uh, yeah, remember $1,000 for the stage. In order for us to kind of break even on the stage, we would need to um, pay candidates $10 um, if, if we wanted to keep the stage. But I mean, let's say we give a payout of $8 for the candidate. Um, then the simple math, we pay $800, and that's $200 saved. But wait, there is more. We just eliminated another stage too, right? No, don't worry, we didn't eliminate the candidates. We, we eliminated the stage. Um, we have, that's $1,000 right there for that stage. We have, we have saved $12,000 total for that stage. That's just for one job. Okay, um, um, you know, just, just, just to be realistic here. Yeah, there are other factors involved. Like, um, you know, let's assume a developer makes $100 an hour, then, um, you know, that would, um, you know, there would be $100 that the developer would, would be working on it and reviewing the code. Um, so, you know, you could guesstimate that it would be like $900 saved per, per job. But still, I mean, eliminating both those two steps with these gleanings. But yes, I mean, we do need to be careful. Um, like, a, you know, because we don't want to have our API keys public, right? <laughs> Not a good idea. Or passwords or other sensitive info. There might be legal challenges too. Like I would recommend talking with your, the legal team on your um, company before embarking on any of this. Uh, there could also be the um, problem of a candidate might feel entitled for this. They might feel entitled to um, that, hey, I, I did this job for you. I mean, I need something more full time, right? Um, and so I, I would also recommend uh, doing cost benefit analysis for your company to make sure that this really does help with your, um, with your company. So I, w I want to end this talk, um, and I guess I am a bit earlier, I guess I am getting done a bit earlier than I had hoped, and so I can leave the rest of the time for, for questions. Um, so some food for thought. Who would you consider the poor and the foreigner at your company, at, 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 in the tech industry or at your company? And poor doesn't necessarily mean, mean, doesn't necessarily have to mean monetary value, right? Because at, at, at a company, you could be, everybody could be paid just about the same. Um, I mean, especially in tech. Uh, but, you know, there are other ways that somebody could be poor, right? And so how can we be mindful of those people on, at, at our company or in the tech industry as a whole? Uh, what can we do now as an organization to serve the needy? Um, like we don't have to do all these grand, um, all these grand uh, um, virtue signaling of, oh look, you know, we we did this really cool event um, to to feed the poor. You know, like what what can we do now as an organization in what we kn in what we can do, in what we know how to do. You know, like um, what our company does. Like how can our company serve best with in our own capacity. And more practically, what are some back burner bugs that we need to take care of? Um, we can use these back burner bugs as, as gleanings for, for job candidates. And then finally, how's your project documentation, <laughs> right? I mean, this could be a really good practical way for job candidates to apply for a job. Um, like what, who better else to write your documentation than somebody on the outside who is familiar with the stack? I was at some other talks previously where they were talking about this, where um, 
it can be so easy to get involved to have have the blinders on and get so focused on your product or your project that you you write terrible documentation that doesn't necessarily have that doesn't necessarily help users at all and so what are, what are ways that um the and and so maybe the documentation could be something that 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 job candidates could work on and so that is all for the talk i um i am on social media twitter and minds.com i'm not sure if anybody um, likes that social network, but I'm on there. And Element, if anybody wants to hit me up on Element, uh, matrix.org, and then I'm on there. Um, that is it for the talk. Um, are there any questions from people? Okay. Um, and with that, I would like to thank you, thank everybody, and that is all. Thank you.